welcome back. Um, we are now moving into our afternoon sessions for those of you in this time zone, in the UK time zone or in Europe. And um, Anna Jackman is going to be the chair for this session called Drones and Green Securitization. Where does monitoring become surveillance? So handing over to Anna. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning to some of our panelists as well who are up nice and early. Um, I'd really like to welcome everyone to today's session um, in which we'll be exploring drones and green securitization, reflecting on distinctions between and the blurring of monitoring and surveillance in the context of conservation. Um, so for, for those um, who may not um, know me, which is probably lots of people on the call, um, my name is Dr. Anna Jackman and I'm a lecturer in human geography at Royal Holloway University. Um, and I'm a bit of an interloper um, as a drone geographer in this conversation rather than a conservation scholar. So I've already learned loads, um, but it's a real pleasure to chair this session um, as it speaks in some really interesting ways to my own um, research. So um, in my research, just for a bit of context, um, I'm interested in technological visibilities, volumes, relations and futures. Um, and I approach these through the lens of the unmanning of everyday life, um, examining both lived experiences of domestic and domesticated drones um, and non-human relations, care and harm in the drone age. Now, in the conference so far, there's been a really clear recognition of the diversity of platforms, capabilities and operational contexts in which we might find conservation drones, as well as discussions around their careful and considered usage, touching on ethics, safety, privacy, data flow and management and responsibilities to both communities and wildlife. In this session, we're however going to shift focus to examine conservation drones in and as surveillance culture. Here, speakers will, I think in quite different ways, explore the shifts that drone technologies might mark in relation to existing monitoring technologies from satellites to nest cams uh, and interrogate their implications on monitoring practice and visibilities, as well as lived experiences of the drone's capture. Now, there is, of course, um, a growing range of interdisciplinary scholarship that examines the deployment of more than military drones. Um, so by more than military, I mean those that are deployed in applications and spaces that are typically presented as non-military, though, of course, as Trishant's excellent um, plenary uh, uh, sort of informed us, these are often informed by militarized logics as well. Um, and this scholarship really examines drones as accessible, mobile, sporadic, multi-sensory, malleable and repurposable and algorithmically mediated surveillance actors. And it approaches drones in diverse contexts, often um, spotlighting policing and commercialized airspace. Now, we're also, of course, increasingly seeing work foregrounding conservation and humanitarian interventions, exploring the reframing and repurposing of drones as tech explicitly for good. And this work both speaks to and raises questions for drone research methodologies interested in the drone's vertical and volumetric dimensions and data capture opportunities, relational implications and the placing and enacting of particular responsibilities. So here we see consideration uh, for how, why and for whom are drones kind of being deployed and what social and power relations and agencies are enacted in their deployment. And today's session, we'll see aspects of these debates recited and enlivened in conservation and disaster contexts. So in terms of the, the format for the session, we'll have four 10 minute interventions um, and we'll have five speakers in the running order of Libby, Francis, uh, Brock and Karis, and then Law. And they'll expand upon these discussions in really interesting and exciting ways, contextualizing debates around green securitization and examining their intersections with drones through cited and situated case studies attentive to multiple human and non-human actors, agencies, and experiences. And I'll um, introduce each speaker properly before um, they speak. 
Now, there will, of course, be opportunities for you to ask questions um, and we'll hear from each of these speakers first and then have a kind of open Q&A discussion afterwards. So please do feel free to add questions in the chat um, throughout the, the kind of proceedings um, or to use the raise hand function when it comes to the Q&A at the end. Um, and then I just thought I would plug the um, Twitter handle that um, people are using, which is hashtag Drone Ecologies 2021. Um, so I will now stop sharing my screen um, and we'll pass over to um, Libby as our first speaker. Um, so it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Libby. She is an Associate Professor in Environmental Studies and a geographer and political ecologist with research interests in green militarization, the illegal wildlife trade, environmental displacement and efforts to make conservation um, more inclusive. Now today Libby reflects on what it might mean to explore drones within the context of biodiversity in crisis, militarized conservation and the need for conservation to be more attuned to local needs. Um, so the floor is yours, Libby, and I'll let you know when you are at 10 minutes. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, and thank you to Naomi and to all the organizers for organizing this excellent workshop. I'm sorry for the poor lighting right now. It's super early in the morning where I am, um, but uh, hopefully you can bear with me. Um, so as Anna said, I'm a geographer, political ecologist, and most of my work has been in Southern Africa along the Mozambique South Africa border where I've looked at environmental displacement, conservation induced displacement uh, and increasingly green militarization. But over the last few years, I've also um, been starting a research project on indigenous led conservation in Blackfoot territory along uh, the US Canada border. And both of these projects have shaped my thinking about conservation technologies and drones and so forth. And uh, you'll see a bit, about, a bit of that as I move forward, although most of these insights are really drawn from the work in, in South Africa in part because that's more developed. Um, so from what I, I wasn't able to see the talks earlier this morning, given the time difference, um, but I understand that Rosaline and Trishon provided a really robust understanding of um, green securitization, green militarization, militarization of conservation and so forth. And so when we think about debates over drones, I think it's very important that we kind of place those debates in that context of the fact that conservation has long had this um, engagement with militarized practices, and that's really increased over the last decade, uh, tied in part to um, the rise in the uh, illegal wildlife trade of rhinos and elephants and so forth, with these militarized um, responses being one of the core responses to those. And there's been a really robust literature on uh, why uh, that's particularly, um, that militarized response is particularly problematic. And so drones come in there uh, in the context of the, these um, really high tech um, or, or you know, technological responses. So what I've been thinking about um, is when we think about drones and uh, sort of the ethical debates around drone usage, it's really important to place those within this context, not only of militarized conservation, but really more broadly what's going on with conservation where you have these dual pressures of this um, global biodiversity crisis on the one hand, um, and on the other hand, you have this, um, this drive to make conservation more inclusive to local and indigenous communities, but militarized conservation tends to alienate local communities. And so what I want to say is, um, in some sense, situated at that, that, that tension of what's going on with conservation. And there's really four, five kind of intersecting points that I'd like to make. Um, and the first one, um, I imagine this has been discussed earlier, but I think it's an important point to, um, to bring to the fore is that there's been legitimate anxiety over drones in part because they have emerged through military warfare. And the movement from drones from the battlefield into conservation in many ways was quite, um, quite seamless. And I think that made a number of us quite uncomfortable that there was not um, early on a lot of critical reflection about the use of taking uh, technologies that are used for warfare and moving them in, into conservation. And in part that anxiety comes from the fact that the usage of drones is emerging at this time that conservation itself is increasingly militarized. And so this, I think this tension around genesis is really important to, to take into consideration. Um, but I think a much bigger issue, and I imagine this is coming out through a lot of the presentations, 
is really the issue of power relations. And this is really, I think, the crux of a lot of the concern. Um, although there are counterexamples, and I think a growing number of counterexamples where drones are, are used to support more local and indigenous um, types of conservation, um, one of the problems is that um, for drones and other surveillance technologies is that it's not local and indigenous communities that often control those technologies and how they're used and for what ends. So this is really a question of power. It's a question um, of how those drones are used and what, um, again, who, who owns those technologies and, and, and what ends they're, they're put for, forward to. And this is maybe, I think, the biggest question of all is taking into account these power relations. But I think um, there's other issues to pay attention here as well. And one of the ones that's really important um, is knowledge uh, and how drones do enable this type of disembodied knowledge, really like literally knowledge above, um, knowledge that's not place uh, specific. And this contrasts, I think, in really uncomfortable ways with um, the nature of indigenous and local knowledges that tend to be more place-based um, rooted in place, rooted in long-term engagement and commitment to place. Um, whereas drones, you know, again, their knowledge tends to be more, more abstract, disembodied from above. And for me, for a long time, this was a really vexing issue, and I think it still is. But one of the things that complicated this for me is um, seeing the work done on um, Blackfoot-led bison restoration across the U.S.-Canada border and the ways in which Blackfoot ecologists are using drones. And I think there's a sense in which that, you know, there is a bit of a disconnect, but it doesn't mean that you can't use the master's tools to bring down the master's house, if you will. So um, I think that this is a vexing issue, but it's not an insurmountable one, thinking about the way in which um, you have this tension between different knowledge systems, but that it does become possible to integrate those and to braid those together. Um, but I think it requires uh, quite a bit of political work to make sure that that's done in a you know, more democratic way. The fourth point is just one about relationships. Uh, we know through lots of research over decades that good sustainable eth ethical conservation is built through uh, relationships, relationships between people. Drones can't build relationships, people can. Um, conservation actors with boots on the ground, including rangers, they can build these good relationships and potentially drones can be a good tool in that. Um, but it's, I think it's dangerous to place too much emphasis on drones and what they can accomplish it because they cannot build those relationships at the end of the day. Um, and I think if drones, to the extent that they can give more power to already powerful conservation organizations that um, in historically and today have dispossessed local communities Drones can actually make power relations worse, which at the end of the day can make conservation worse um, because you need those conservations for good conservation outcomes. Okay, the fifth point, um, and this is an important one, and I think one that's not receiving enough attention, is the question about money and who's funding drones and questions of greenwashing. Uh, military firms are donating um, surveillance technologies and pursuit technologies, including drones, to conservation organizations to uh, support their conservation efforts. But I think this is particularly problematic where you have military corporations that not only create um, you know, mili militarized technologies for profit, but militarized technologies outside of the conservation realm are responsible for a massive amount of human misery and ecological destruction. And there's something particularly egregious about, I think, military corporations then turning and giving this technology to conservation, um, which is really a form of greenwashing. And um, I'll just read a little blurb that I wrote in a paper that gets at this, um, this problem of greenwashing. So as a form of corporate social responsibility, Military firms garner public attention and praise for their generous assistance, generous in quotes, um, in helping protecting wildlife as a national or even global resource or global good. Well, this enables a, sne a sneaky magician's trick. In drawing our attention to threaten wildlife in these high-tech, um, largely militarized responses to their protection, we're often left bedazzled. And this happens through um, really sophisticated marketing on their end. Um, and so our attention is hence directed away from the tanks, aircrafts, missiles, bombs, and small arms produced by military firms, as well as the environmental destruction they leave behind in their wake. Here, military corporations are exploiting conservation and our support for conservation 
and state obligations to protect wildlife in a way that leaves us blind to the larger political economy of violence that they reap uh, benefit from and reap profit from and that they ultimately enable. So I think this is you know, really um, calling the um, ethics of military uh, involvement in and their gifts of military technology uh, to conservation organizations to protect threatened species. I think we need to be really, really weary about that. Um, I don't know if there's time in the Q&A, but I have a short 30-second um, video that's a, basically an advertisement from one of these military corporations uh, that gets at this. Um, but for the sake of time, I just want to close by um, saying that when we think about this moment of conservation, it is one of biodiversity crisis. I don't think this is just a discursive crisis. I think it's also an actual crisis. We need to take this seriously. But within that, there's growing recognition, um, and increasingly among mainstream conservation organizations as well, that for conservation um, to be effective, that it does have to pay attention to indigenous local communities and their needs and perspectives. Uh, this is an issue of human rights. Also, you have to have respectful people park relationships um, for conservation to work because it's these communities that uh, support conservation. And then there's increasing evidence that indigenous led conservation and local conservation has um, equal conservation outcomes or even better conservation outcomes than uh, Western conservation. And this may change the equation, these sort of recognitions, because this might bring more focus on how drones can support indigenous and local conservation efforts, um, because this supports these communities and it supports conservation. And so I think um, my initial reluctance to drones has really been transformed by seeing what's going on in Blackfoot territory and the way that um, that drones don't necessarily have to lead to these militarized and dis, um, dispossessing outcomes, that there is a way to de democratize um, drones, but it really requires us to take into account these points around power and knowledge production, moving away from greenwashing and so forth. So I think on that, I'm a bit over time I'm going to stop and turn it back to the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Libby. That was brilliant. And um, you were absolutely perfectly to time. So I really appreciate that. Um, so our next speaker uh, is Francis. Um, Francis is a lecturer in the Department of Geography and Environmental Sciences, and his research adopts a political ecology and political geography approach to explore conservation security and law enforcement um, to address the illegal wildlife trade. And he is going to today um, explore green securitization and conservation by bringing together interests in conservation policing and the foregrounding of local situated and cited case studies, in part to critically reflect on how, in spite of the rhetoric and hype that surrounds them, um, commonplace drones actually are in conservation contexts and applications. So thank you very much, Francis. Um, the floor is yours and I'll let you know when you're um, at 10 minutes. Great, thanks. Um, so I guess, like Chris said yesterday, it's impossible to share your screen without asking if it's sharing. Um, can you see my screen? It's perfect. Great. Um, I'm going to leave my video off because my internet is rubbish. Um, and if I do kind of freeze up, please just let me know and I'll, I'll try to figure something out. Um, so thanks for the invite. I'm going to jump right into it because I think I pick up on quite a few points where kind of Libby left off or take them in sort of a, a, a different direction. So I do research uh, primarily in Mozambique and to a lesser extent South Africa on commercial poaching economies and the anti-poaching and law enforcement responses to those. And what I found interesting about many of the discussions yesterday was how uh, a lot of the conversation about drone work was actually not related to anti-poaching. Uh, which for me is really interesting because I'm so focused on that kind of angle of conservation. Uh, so I am speaking from a context of drone and tech being used specifically for anti-poaching, security, and policing purposes, not for broader ecological monitoring. And while they're deployed in conservation areas, uh, these technologies are often designed, developed, and I think importantly deployed and used on the ground more by security, policing, and military professionals rather than conservationists per se, uh, rather than ecologists, and definitely not by communities living in and around those areas. And with this said, um, I am concerned about ethics, but in this short presentation, I want to focus a bit more on 
kind of what this means for anti-poaching and conservation practice and why this matters. So I've done a little bit of work on drones um, and anti-poaching and conservation. Uh, I didn't set out to focus on drones, but through ethnographies, through spending a lot of time with rangers in uh, poaching hotspots, specifically the rhino poaching hotspot in the Mozambique South African border, I came to understand how, uh, as I write in, in, in this article, that in response to commercial poaching, right, we're seeing an increasingly use of aerial technologies or going aerial to mobilize the vertical as a dimension of space and power to protect wildlife, neutralize threats, namely poachers, and secure conservation areas below. So like uh, Libby was mentioning, this is really the use of aerial technologies um, to alter the power dynamics uh, in the anti-poaching or conservation uh, versus poacher setting. So verticality here, I think, becomes important as both an empirical and analytical phenomena. And it really matters for understanding the power dynamics in the spaces of conservation, how that's happening and why that matters. And I'm gonna share this picture from um, a project called Connected Conservation, kind of put forward by Cisco and a few others. It's a few years old, but I like it because it kind of captures a lot of the spectacular aspects of um, all the different techs and technologies used in anti-poaching. And this is an example of a pilot study that they've actually rolled out in South Africa, adjacent to Kruger. Um, and what I find interesting here and what I found interesting in my research is, is how the aerial intersects with other technologies, right? Whether it's drones or helicopters or satellites. Uh, and we can't lose sight of how drones and aerial techs fit into this broader picture of an increasingly technologically oriented or mediated practice of anti-poaching. Uh, they don't exist on their own. Uh, so this example here, uh, it's kind of rather extreme, perhaps ideal, um, at least the connected conservation community would like to see this as an ideal. And there's kind of three main aspects here. One is the surveillance of movement in red. This is mainly where drones come in. Two uh, in yellow is the collection and surveillance of individual data. Uh, and the third in green is this information being fed into a system for reaction, deployment of patrols, rangers, and so forth. But I wanna be clear that in this context of anti-poaching, the use of these technologies is about the surveillance of people, specifically about the surveillance of people and specific types of people. And we see this in the connected conservation. And we also see that in the literature on the use of technologies for anti-poaching purposes, um, whether they be sensors, such as in the quote below, whether they be helicopters, satellites, or aerial technologies they are being implemented with the specific purpose of surveilling people. And, I was, and importantly, surveilling their movement. Another example that um, I really like to draw attention to is what's called the anti-poaching engine, set up by a group of people out of the US, um, computer scientists um, and IT professionals. And the anti-poaching engine, again, is a blending of different types of technology, but largely focus on the use of drones and satellites. And here, what the anti-poaching engine seeks to do is use drones and satellites to monitor and surveil and track the movements of rangers, uh, suspected poachers, and wildlife, such as elephants and rhino. This information is then collected and it's fed into algorithm, algorithmic equations, right? So as they say, it's a data-driven behavioral-based uh, model for anti-poaching. And it's a tool to use this information gathered largely by aerial technologies to predict the behavior of rhinos, predict the behavior and locations of poachers, and therefore where you can predict the most optimal use of rangers or other interventions. And this is just one of many similar types of approaches that we can see in SMART, Seymour, Capture, and lots of other um, kind of integrated tech platforms with uh, rather interesting acronyms. So where do drones, satellites, et cetera, fit in for anti-poaching? Well, I think they're one piece of the puzzle. And, and, and what I've seen and on the ground and what I've read in this literature about them is that they really come in to help with predictability and how by feeding information into kind of an algorithmic, 
uh, way of doing things, an algorithmic approach to anti-poaching. Even if not using algorithms per se, uh, I've seen in more low tech kind of context that that type of data that is gathered uh, is used uh, to feed into decision making about how to optimize the use of scarce resources such as rangers. How to predict where either the rhinos will be or where the poachers will be to then intercept or to react. So it removes a lot of the guesswork from anti-poaching. So the main question I have here is though, is this rendering technological or rendering technical? And I'll break down what I mean by rendering technical uh, in a second. Um, but before I do so, like Chris mentioned yesterday, um, like I know how Libby and, other, and others as well feel that we, you know, myself and others, we support conservation. We want to see it su successful. I want to see poaching sustainably addressed for all of the social and ecological harms it poses. And I don't want to level a blanket critique against technologies because they do have a role to play. But I do think we should exercise a healthy skepticism about notions that they may provide a quote unquote solution. And there's two main concerns that I want to turn towards this technology mediated and poaching. These don't have to do with the technology itself, but uh, because technology is neither good or bad, but depends how it is used and for what purposes. So the first concern, um, which I'll just touch on briefly, because I think we've gone over it a lot already, is that technology is being used to strengthen the fortress of conservation. We see a lot of lip service paid to clearing the park from the outside and community engagement, um, but increasingly the fortress of conservation is being brought into the digital age with the assistance of technology. What we're seeing in some areas is the creation of a digital or electronic fortress, such as that connected conservation photo. Uh, and this is a trend we see in other security and policing contexts, uh, whether it be borders or cities as well. And as Libby mentioned, this risks aggravating already strained park people relations. My second concern uh, is a, going beyond rendering technological. And I think anti-poaching is becoming technical. And I use rendering technical, it is a bit of a jargon, uh, drawing from Tanya Lee. And she argues that rendering technical has to do with the process through which experts identify a deficiency and a technical intervention is devised to address it. So in this context, poaching and by default, poachers, rangers, animals, landscapes, and so forth are produced as abstract entities detached from their political, economic, social, ecological, and historical contexts. So anti-poaching and by extension conservation becomes a technical exercise of spatial control by surveilling, predicting, and responding to movements of people and animals within and through spaces of conservation. So this is a technical exercise of what the anti-poaching engine team refers to as spatial temporal optimization, right? So optimizing the, the allocation of rangers and interventions over space. And we see this type of logic uh, and abstraction in the development uh, and deployment of drone supported tech and algorithmic approaches to anti-poaching that you can see on the slide here. And again, there's no doubt that uh, technology can act as a force multiplier, facilitate kind of the, the detection and tracking of poachers, and it may even act as a deterrent to would-be poachers. Um, it can be useful and can be valuable in conservation, but are these the practices that um, one, are ethical, two, are effective, and three, can really get us to the sustainable solution that we need to address poaching problems? And 30 more seconds, um, this is just a recap, but a few questions I wanna end on um, keeping this in mind is, you know, to what extent are drones and new tech actually being used? Um, so a lot of talk about drones, but in a lot of areas are actually not being used on the ground. Why is that? Where they are being used, how effective are they? What metrics is success based on? What metrics are ignored? And I think for me, the most important one uh, sort of what Libby was mentioning too, but in a different direction is about the political economy around the use development and adoption of these technologies. And specifically is a focus on technology, diverting resources and attention from other approaches to conservation and anti-poaching, namely community engagement and from ecological and biological monitoring. And we see evidence of this happening. 
And then what lessons can we learn from other policing contexts where these texts have been successful or unsuccessful? Uh, thank you. Thanks, Francis. Um, that's brilliant. Um, so we're going to move on um, now to Brock and Karis. Um, and Brock will be speaking, as I understand it, but his um, co-author, Karis, is also in the audience as well. Um, so Brock is a lecturer in international development and whose work explores how natural resource management shapes and is shaped by human and non-human relationships in the context of biodiversity conservation, natural resource extraction and sustainable development. Um, and Karis is a presidential fellow in the Global Development Institute and Karis's work explores the impacts of large scale investments in land on rural lives and rural ecologies. Um, so in their talk today, through the lens of the desert locust crisis in Kenya, Brock and Karis will explore issues around verticality, power and recognition and access to and the production of knowledge in the context of drones and disaster uh, response. So I'll hand over to you, Brock, and I'll just give you a flag when you're at 10 minutes. Brilliant. That's great. Thank you. All right, excellent. Sorry for that delay. Um, thanks very much for that introduction. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here today and to be part of this really fascinating uh, workshop. So thank you for including us. As was said, um, I'm presenting on, on the behalf of a larger group of authors and research team, uh, and one of them, Karis Enns, uh, is here in the audience today and, and can participate in the discussion. And specifically, I'm going to be talking about work that we've called the shifting plains of desert locust control in East Africa. For this presentation, uh, we're going to focus basically on, on increasing reliance on aerial network technology and, and desert locust control operations in East Africa. And focusing specifically on Northern Kenya, our intention is to argue that as technological innovations take the methods used to manage desert locusts higher up and further away from the physical landscapes where desert locust upsurges occur, decisions about how to anticipate and respond to threats posed by desert locusts are increasingly removed from local contexts and populations. So in other words, growing reliance on airplanes, drones, and satellites, as well as the information they generate is shifting power away from affected populations and into the hands of remote experts. In the following slides, I'm going to briefly discuss some of the literature that's informing our, our argument. Uh, before providing an overview of, of how the use of aerial automated technologies has intensified over the past century or so in northern Kenya and discussing what the implications are for power relations. So this presentation is based on research that's been carried out uh, on the current desert locust upsurge happening in northern Kenya and this research was done between February last year and January of this year uh, and we've currently sort of prepared an, an article based on this research which, which is what this talk is based on. And this article brings together literature on the necropolitics of disaster management and on vertical planetary geographies. So very briefly, a necropolitics understanding of disaster management argues that in designing interventions that aim to help certain populations survive disasters, calculated decisions are made about which population should be killed or allowed to die in order for this to happen. And for those of you familiar with the current inquest into the handling of the COVID-19 pandemic here in the UK, um, there was an example of a whiteboard shared that the government used to plan for the pandemic. And on the whiteboard was the phrase written, who do we not save? So this is effectively what necropolitics is all about. And part of our argument in, in this work is that automated artificially intelligent technologies are increasingly relied on in order to answer this fundamentally political question of who do we not save uh, when it comes to disasters. And in the context of our research, this could be human populations, but it could also be non-human populations as well, such as certain types of pollinators, vegetation, and livestock that are affected by pesticide. 
So to make this argument, uh, we also turn to some geographical literature uh, concerned with the exercise of power through vertical networked and planetary space. Recent advances, uh, as we've heard throughout the workshop in aerial technologies means that disaster management increasingly unfolds through planetary spaces, including the Earth's atmosphere. And these technologies are enabling disaster authorities to effectively predict the future, to calculate where and how disasters will unfold, who will be affected and how, and who should be designated as killable and savable. So these are the main uh, academic debates and discussions that we aim to contribute to. Next, I'm gonna say a little bit more about the background and context of the current desert locust upsurge in Northern Kenya. Uh, in 2019, unusually wet conditions in the Arabian Peninsula led to the congregation of large swarms of desert locusts. These swarms reproduced really quickly and spread across the greater Horn of Africa, due as well to uh, unusually wet conditions in that arid and semi-arid region as well. And since the early parts of 2020, swarms of desert locusts have been migrating and reproducing uh, all across northern Kenya. Because of the speed at which swarms can travel and the volumes of food they consume in the form of crops, pasture, and vegetation, desert locusts are understood to be one of the most dangerous uh, and destructive migratory pests in the world. Northern Kenya in particular is a region dominated by transhumans pastoralists and a place where desert locust outbreaks occur on a somewhat regular basis. Uh, so the devastation caused by desert locusts to pastures and vegetation can be quite detrimental to the livelihoods and food security of of pastoralists who are already sort of struggling uh, to be food uh, secure in the region. And it's also worth noting that desert locusts pose a range of hazards to biodiversity as well, so they can be quite concerning to wildlife authorities and conservationists. So how have desert locust populations and, and swarms in northern Kenya been managed over the years? Historically, pastoralists in particular sought to control desert locusts on the very same plains where swarms fed roosted, reproduced, and migrated. And to do so, they used a variety of tactics, ranging from banging on drums and making other loud noises to lighting controlled fires to destroy hoppers, which are juvenile desert locusts that crawl on the ground. These types of measures were, and still to this day, remain quite effective at preventing damage to pasture, but not necessarily at ending an upsurge at a large scale. With British colonization of East Africa at the end of the 19th century, colonial authorities became quite obsessed with controlling desert locusts. And this is because of the threat posed to uh, the economic interests of the empire by locust swarms. And it was colonial authorities and experts who, who introduced insecticidal baiting and the spraying of, of pesticides as a control measure. Uh, and this effectively involved distributing hazardous chemicals directly onto the soil and vegetation with sprayers similar to those or that that's shown on the screen right now, although uh, less sort of less sophisticated earlier on. So these early approaches to managing desert locusts can be understood as horizontal, as they involve mobilizing resources across two-dimensional space, bringing authorities and affected populations into direct contact with each other, as well as with desert locusts and the wider environment. With advances in aerial military technologies and tactics during World War II, desert locust control operations quite literally took to the sky. And from the 1930s until the present really, colonial authorities and later the Kevin Kenyan government and international organizations such as the FAO spent significant resources on improving the efficacy of aerial spraying and surveillance. And the photo on the screen just, just now shows an FAO procured aircraft descending through a locust swarm onto an airstrip on a private wildlife conservancy in northern Kenya called Lewa Wildlife Conservancy. And it's here where a slight sidestep is needed. Uh, between the mid-1990s and the present, northern Kenya has also been experiencing a conservation boom. So in the region, private and community-based conservancies are increasing, and private conservancies in particular are attracting a lot of international conservation finance. And a good deal of this finance is going into anti and counter poaching operations, much like the ones that, that Francis was talking about. So these rely on aerial and surveillance technologies, including aircrafts, drones, satellites, and other technologies. So when the desert locust upsurge struck Northern Kenya in 2020, a number of private conservancies were operating ready built technology that could be mobilized and repurposed for desert locust control operations. <clears throat> 
And conservationists began to play a really active role in surveying and spraying desert locusts in particular, uh, including companies that provide private security uh, to private conservancies. At the same time with all this going on, desert locust experts in Rome were analyzing satellite imagery and remote sensing data to predict where swarms will migrate and when. Airplanes, helicopters, and drones were being scrambled to interrupt and destroy these swarms before they touched down and cause damage. And ground operations were being conducted using data generated by these technologies, which is uh, often devoid of context and out of reach of local populations, as we've also heard about before. So with all this said, to wrap up, desert locust management is no longer primarily occurring on horizontal planes as it once did. It's being conducted by remote experts who rely on aerial automated technologies to design and carry out control operations. So coming back to our sort of literature or, or theoretical framing, this means that automated artificially intelligent technology is actively involved in designing necropolitical disaster interventions in deciding which forms of life will be made killable and which ecologies and ecosystems will be subjected to violent harm. And this is exemplified by the fact that local populations in Northern Kenya have virtually no say over what areas are sprayed with insecticide and when the spraying occurs, over which pesticides are used and whether or not the consequences of this pesticide uh, are deemed acceptable to them. Rather, many across the region have been left to quite literally watch as, as birds and pollinators, uh, pollinators rather, fall from the sky. Uh, livestock become sick and die, and environments become contaminated. So in other words, the use of these technologies is increasing the distance and the volumes of space that separate affected communities from disaster responses. So on that note, I'll say thank you again very much and end here. Thank you so much. That was perfectly timed to the second. Um, right, moving on to our um, final speaker. Um, welcome, Law. Um, Law has undertaken research on conservation surveillance technologies, completing her doctorate this year, and now working as a wildlife trade technical specialist at Fauna and Flora International. Um, speaking to her interests in the use of surveillance technology and conservation and the ways in which particular actors, um, such as NGOs, organize and orient themselves around these tech, today Law will focus on how drone data is fed into algorithms in order to develop predictions about when and where poaching may occur, the implications this has for the direction of resources, and what assumptions around efficiency and efficacy may be embedded within such tech. So um, thanks, Law. The floor is yours, and I'll let you know when you're about at about 10 minutes. Thanks so much, uh, Anna, for a, a brilliant uh, introduction. I'm now sharing my screen and mentioning it uh, in the hope that it works and that someone will let me know if it doesn't. It's great. Um, <laughs> brilliant. So, so yeah, as Anna was saying, this is um, the, the thoughts that I'm going to share today is uh, are, um, have come out of my uh, PhD research that I've undertaken at the University of Sheffield. Um, and I'd like to talk about the assumption and, and implications of predicted algorithms for anti-poaching, which I think will tie in really well with uh, the points that uh, Francis in particular was, was making earlier on, on this panel. Um, so, so yeah, system and structured digital data collection um, has enabled the development of algorithms that make prediction about where poaching is more likely to happen in the future and to recommend deployment of on the ground staff, in particular in protected areas, to deter or intercept uh, illegal hunting. And that's being celebrated as something that's got huge potential um, and, and but during this presentation, I want to point out some of the um, limitations of, of these tools and to not to say that they shouldn't be used, but to improve understanding of, of what they are actually capable of and put them in, in the broader context of um, uh, wildlife conservation. Um, so as, as we've mentioned, this is technology that's coming from um, the security sector, predictive uh, algorithms for, for patrolling and, and um, deployment of police resources or law enforcement resources. Um, so there's a lot to learn from literature about policing, automation, and automation which I draw on as well as um, 
documentary and, and interview materials for my, my PhD on the use of um, surveillance technologies. Um, the anti-poaching applications I'll, uh, I've mostly looked at in, in detail and not do not rely on drone data so much, but as Francis mentioned, drone data is also used in anti-poaching for improved detection in real time, but also for prediction. Um, and so, so I think there's a lot to learn from the, the points that I'm going to make uh, that can translate to drones, and I'm really interested in, in the thoughts of the audience later on and to how that translates for, for, for their work. Um, so how current algorithmic and poaching tools work, um, they use digital is data that's collected uh, either manually through through notebooks or um, handheld devices or um, or through aerial technologies. Um, if manually during, collected during uh, protected area patrols by, by rangers most often. And this is data that's labeled Thematically, for example, there was a there is an instant there was a snare detected, but also has spatial and temporal information attached. And so this historical data is being passed through predictive predictive algorithms to identify areas where the risk of poaching. Um, at the moment, a lot of it is is in in environments that I uh, is around snaring because it's it's easier to have historical um, data around it. Um, yeah, to determine areas where the risk of poaching is higher and to generate patrol itineraries for the responsible authorities to target these areas specifically. Um, and, you know, it's it, uh, linking to the theme of the panel, it's a surveillance tool because this data is collected and analyzed, recommend increased attention and intervention in specific places and indirectly um, over specific groups of people. Um, and it also fits in on the panel on green securitization because poaching prediction and patrol recommendation tools are a direct import from the security and urban policing field. Um, and and uh, all speakers have, have highlighted today how much this cross-pollinization between conservation and, and security can be an issue. Um, there's been a limited attempt of, of uh, a limited number of attempts to use uh, patrol data to make predict or drone data to make prediction and recommendations on how to optimize patrolling in, in protected areas. But one of the main groups that have developed some um, and, you know, that are the, the most um, publicly documented, I, I would say, um, is, is called, uh, it's based at Harvard and their application is called POWS, P-A-W-S. Um, and they've developed this application drawing directly on previous work on anti-terrorism text and, and patrol, patrol, sorry. Um, and so what the, the, this kind of tool succeed in doing according to their, their developers is um, so far in trial settings, POWS for instance, in, they've noted that protected areas, when protected area staff follow the recommended itineraries, they come across more snares um, than they usually would, and they can remove them. Um, but behind that uh, sort of headline of success, I want to dig a little deeper in the workings and relevance of these um, prediction tools. Um, so I want to briefly discuss four points. So, usually glossed over when evaluating and, and celebrating these tools um, and yeah some of them relate to the internal lo logic of, of how these tools work and are developed and others to the broader conservation context that they sit in I think this late latter set of points really relates um, to, to, the to the use of drone more, more broadly as well Again, it's not to say that these tools should not be used, but to pro provide some context and improve the understanding of how they function and limitations. If we move on to the, the first point is around data that's collected. And there's an assumption that this data can be used because it accurately reflects the extent and the characteristics of poaching that happens within the specific area. Um, and that's kind of a that's kind of a bold claim or a very com confident assumption because um, uh, documented in the literature and, and through observation in my own field work, um, we can see that um, patrol data and I would guess also uh, drone data is very limited to where what rangers are 
able and willing and directed to report what um, information they capture and how. And there can be discrepancies in how this is reported, but also biases. And, and these biases can be informed by social prejudice, as, as Trishan um, very clearly showed this morning. So yeah, the data collection effort is not a, a robust and consistent effort because that's it's it's done as part of um, um, patrolling or um, surveillance that that are not a, a scientific data collection effort. They 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 this competing priorities wrapped into these activities. Um, but these sort of data accuracy limitations are some of the that the developers are most aware of and and they're trying to develop both uh, advice and, and statistical methods to to counter these um perhaps uh, more less discussed is the assumption that the analytical models that are used depict poaching dynamics accurately and that the variables that are not included in the model are irrelevant so current applications um, rest on the idea that rangers and as a rational agents that maximize and cost benefits and minimize cost. For example, poachers will poachers prefer preferences will be to catch what um, a high uh, value wildlife species while minimizing the risk of being caught, and that's how they plan their hunt and that's how they react to patrols. But that doesn't really reflect little that we know about why poaching happens, and there can be a range of reasons why people are motivated to look and even though it's illegal it could be for resistance it could be in re retaliation for human wildlife conflict could be in protest against the use of land as protected area and regulations that are associated to it um and so as far as i can tell these are aspects that are not at all included in in these in these tools and in the reflection around them um granted they're they're this is information that's a bit more challenging to collect and to express as quantitative indicators, but it needs to be considered and, and acknowledged. Um, finally, there's, there's two uh, other assumptions that success of, of predicted rely on. The first one is that increased presence of, of rangers. So if they have a, an itinerary that sends them to areas where poaching is likely to, to happen, that the increased presence of, of rangers or law enforcers on the ground sh should be the primary way and is an effective way to deter and prevent poaching. Um, so, so that kind of locks conservation agents and poachers in the game of cats and mouse that doesn't necessarily relate to uh, the other roots and causes of poaching that I was just mentioning. And that's a point that's been made about patrolling and urban street policing for uh, street crime as well. And there's a range of other activities that are complementary and, and necessary um, to to grapple with with thorny issues like poaching, for example, community based action for prevention um, and mitigation of, of conflict with wildlife and, and so on. Um, the last assumption is that when patrols are given an itinerary developed through um, when sorry, when on the ground staff are given recommendations developed through algorithms, they will actually follow them. Um, in, in my my research has shown that there could be, there could be a, a mistrust and resistance to technological tools from um, on the ground staff uh, who, who, for instance, have uh, in the past been shown to resist and avoid data collection systems that that track their movement and work. So they, it could well be the case that they also um, react in similar ways to um, to rec tools that that provide recommendations. Uh, for their itinerary and work. Um, so in conclusion, I hope you've found this, uh, this brief overview of the assumptions underlying and poaching algorithmic tools helpful and that some of them, um, and yeah, they, they want to point out that some of these assumptions are, are not or unlikely to be realized um, and, and use that as an encouragement to A, acknowledge and reflect on their limitations and inadequacies of the of, of surveillance tools, but also to support a diversity of activities to grapple with conservation issues that are uh, very complex, like poaching, and and consider tech as a, a useful but nonetheless uh, limited tool and not a silver bullet. Bullet, and in some cases, recognize that it can be counterproductive, as Trishant was very clearly illustrated.
this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Law. Um, that was brilliant. Um, if I could ask the speakers just to um, return and wherever internet allows um, to pop their cameras on, that would be great. Um, we are having some internet issues, so if anyone disappears for a minute, um, it's probably to do with that. Um, we will get started um, straight away on the questions because there's lots of them and people are very excited to ask you lots of questions. Um, we've got um, Georgios on tech support who's very kindly um, kind of bundled some of these up. Um, so I'm going to do my best to kind of work through these. Um, some of them are uh, directed to specific people and some of them are a bit kind of broader. Um, so we have a, a first question um, from the mural. Um, and I uh, believe that this is kind of slightly directed at Libby based on some comments, but I'm sure others are, are welcome to jump in. And this is really who is funding these drones. So um, if we're going to think about these power relations, um, which we should obviously across conservation take more broadly, um, who is funding these and, and kind of what does that mean for power relations? So I'll open that up to Libby first. Yeah, thank you. There was a really interesting chat discussion going on on this. I mean, the short answer is I don't know. I haven't done a sophisticated analysis, um, but from the South African case, which granted is a limited case, but I think in a, like an iconically important one, um, it's not just drones, but it's the military um, hardware more broadly. Um, a lot of that has been provided by military corporations, both state owned and um, and private, and I mean the, the big one there is the the Paramount Group, who some of you have may heard of may have heard of, but they're one of the biggest um, military private military corporations in the world, and definitely the biggest one in Africa with global reach, um, and they've provided um, militarized uh, hardware, including um, surveillance and pursuit and apprehension helicopters. Um, so definitely, we're talking about the vertical area here, and I think what's interesting about what they're doing um, is that there's a lot of pageantry around it. <laughs> um, it's not just like a gift, but it's a gift with, with a great deal of pageantry and, and look how generous we are in, in supporting um, the, the rhinos and so forth. And Anna, if I could spend 30 seconds to show a video, <laughs> it's a great uh, segue here. So let me just see if I can do that. Please do. So this is a video um, celebrating their support of anti-poaching in South Africa. Um, this is a CGI video uh, showing a tank that they produce morph into uh, a like superhero that fights poachers. So let me just show this really fast. And you get a sense of this greenwashing that's happening. So I'll shut that down. Um, but I think, let me stop sharing. I think that can give you a, a, you know, a pretty good sense of the way in which, uh, in this case, the, the Paramount Group is using rhino poaching as a way um, to greenwash their military activities that are, again, sort of you know, violate human rights at such a fundamental level and leave this trail of environmental destruction behind them. And so I think important to be really critical about um, embracing drones and not really thinking about the, the larger political economy. And one of the things that was so fascinating in the chat was uh, these various ways in which the political economy of, of um, drone usage and production and the disposal of waste um, come together. Um, not, not to say we shouldn't be using drones in conservation, but we have to have a critical approach that uh, in many ways is like follow the money. Um, so maybe that's all stopped with the follow the money because I think it's a really important point. Thank you. It's, it's a, it was a really wonderful point. And as someone who's super fascinated by uh, the kind of visual cultures of military and militarized tech, that was um, a horrifying video, but super, super interesting. Um, there is a question which I think links quite nicely to one of your points there around um, from, from Seth that's around um, the kind of end of the drone life. 
Um, so where do the electronics go? Um, and he mentions marine crashes and toxicity, etc. And I think this links really nicely to some of the points earlier about thinking about actually tracing, um, kind of not just follow the money, but follow the thing more broadly to bring in some kind of human geography methods around tracing the production um, and uh, consumption and end of life of, of particular objects. Um, so I think that's a, a really nice point. Did anyone want to add anything about the drones at the end of life? So any uh, examples from your own research or communities using drones about how they might get rid of these technologies or any thoughts on that, that issue? I, I have brief thoughts. Um, I have, sure. So it was not community use, but national park use. And I think for drones and for other technologies that have potentially toxic um, substances or, or materials in them, there's not really a thinking into the recycling of, of these and, and repurposing at all um, from what I've been able to observe and, and write about. So yes, it is a concern um, that we share. Thank you. Go ahead, Francis. Um, I was following the chat too. So kind of not the end of life, but maybe beginning of life of drones linked to the kind of mining companies. Uh, there's interesting connections to not that I work on, I know maybe Brock and Karis might be able to speak more to this, but Devin Holterman, who's done work on kind of anti-poaching and conservation mining instructions in Tanzania, for example, looks at how, um, you know, basically in exchange for mining companies getting access to uranium mining in the Salu, uh, they kind of give back, that sort of greenwashing would be talking about of get access to this heritage, UNESCO heritage site for mining and uh, as the quid pro quo, they kind of support anti-poaching. I don't know if they're using drones per se, but kind of support the security and anti-poaching of the reserve. Um, yeah, we won't go into whether that's good or not, but it's, ha it, it's a connection that's happening. Thank you. Um, and just to flag um, that in the, the chat, um, Nicholas Vargas uh, Ramirez um, raised a really interesting point about that, um, stating that one of their concerns about the use and spread of drones is their construction, in it, that it's heavily dependent on open pit mining. Um, so this essentially means that some communities pay with their territories for the use of drones for conservation elsewhere. So I think I just wanted to flag because I think that's um, kind of very eloquent and beautifully written and really speaks to those power relations as well as that question of of the kind of beginning and end of um, drone life per se. Um, I wanted to uh, raise another question. So there was a question um, from Naomi to Libby, um, though others feel free to, to chip in. Um, and uh, Naomi was thinking about the economy side of drones. In the work that Monica and her are doing in Colombia, they have found that drone companies are increasingly subcontracted in order to do specific tasks of monitoring. Different from the military dynamic, this can still create new problems as the company may have no real interest in conservation or communities. So the, there are these whole new economies growing around the tech and we're really seeing this actually in many other contexts kind of um, domestically as well, for example, with increasingly commercialized airspace. Um, so we just uh, wanted to see if you had a comment kind of about this subcontracting as well and others feel free to, to chip in after Libby too. Just wave at me if you have anything to say. Yeah, in some ways, I think it's it's about this sort of professionalization of conservation into new areas that is really becoming a problem uh, because it's moving away from sort of the core mandates, I think, not only of um, caring for wildlife and ecological processes, but caring for the communities that are that are part of that. So I don't really have anything to add, but just to say it's a it's a problem we see elsewhere. Um, in Southern Africa in particular. And I, this might be moving us into a slightly different um, area, but something I kept thinking about throughout all the presentations um, is the, the question of um, like political capacity. And one of the differences I think between what I see from my work in with the Blackfoot um, uh, in, in North America and the Shangan in Southern Africa is how much more political capacity the Blackfoot have. And I don't wanna make it sound like Africa is so screwed up, which I think could be a, an implication of what this comparison, and it's not what I'm getting at, but the, the Blackfoot are really a powerful indigenous group. And I think they control the means upon which conservation happens uh, in many ways. So they control the means upon which drone usage happens. And I think thinking about political capacity um, is really important important to this um, because if you have the political capacity you get to control 
um, how drones are used, but you also get to control things like what Naomi was talking about, about how subcontracting happens uh, and to control, uh, to, to control that as well. So that just to me seems like a really important subtext that's come across all these talks is really about political capacity. Thank you. Um, if no one else is waving at me to add anything else, I think I'll move on to a question um, from Hewan to Francis. Um, Hewan, thanks you for your um, great presentation um, and uh, has a few questions that um, if it, about whether it is possible to apply drones in anti-poaching efforts in high density vegetation such as tropical forests. So maybe about um, the kind of context in which they are kind of useful and perhaps um, the context in which they might be limited as well. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. I responded a bit to it in the chat, but I'll kind of re repeat what I said, um, that it, it definitely is a challenge, the kind of ecology, topography, terrain, um, drones, at least the ones used in anti-poaching at the moment, can't see through treetops and foliage and things like that. Um, they can't see at night. Um, you know, they could do this if they had the proper infrared thermal imaging on top of that, but right now, at least from last I, I know is they don't have the payloads to be able to carry that, um, that type of equipment. And Kruger National Park, uh, Libby can talk about this too, had a one year trial period for drones. And because of these issues, among others, sort of distance, battery life, et cetera, decided not to use them. Um, I also mentioned um, there, <laughs> we have colleagues in the room who actually use drones in tropical forests. So I'm sure they can answer that better than I could. Um, and, you know, they do, they, I think Laura mentioned this in the chat too, like they are being used for other types of quote unquote infractions or illicit activities, whether it's locating mining camps, timber camps, you know, charcoal ovens and things like that. Um, if I can make one quick point about the political economy thing, because I was thinking about conversation we were having yesterday in the breakout group and why I started my presentation saying um, that a lot of the actors I, I was, I was with who are using these technologies were not coming from a conservation background, but from that security, military, police background is, you know, I think some of our questions wonder, you know, how much do we look to is kind of the drones or technology bringing in these actors or are these security, military actors entering this space and bringing tech with them? Um, and kind of how much agency we give to the technology of kind of shifting who and what practices are used or is it sort of, you know, we have this securitized paramilitary approach and the technology helps them do their work. Um, it's something I've been thinking about the kind of, I don't think there's an answer to which way these relationships flow, but I think a lot is happening in a broader context of political economy of secured private security and the military existing in these spaces and maybe not using drones, but for sure working on the ground in terms of intelligent networks, things like that, and being subcontracted for anti-poaching. Thank you, that's great. Um, we've got a question for um, Brock and Karis. Um, a couple of questions, one is very short and one is a bit longer. So the very short question um, is from Andy, um, which uh, is, thank you very much for an excellent talk. Have you published an article on the Desert Locust stuff? So if you have, please share that in the chat and pop, um, you know, uh, publicize your fab work. And the second question is from Mural, our nice um, tech floating entity for the event. Um, and it, the mural question asks, is there a trade-off between consulting local communities on control measures such as the use of drones and pesticides, and then actually controlling the plague, which moves so fast and causes so much damage to food security? Um, oh, sorry. We haven't published, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, we haven't published a paper yet and it feels like we may never, but if you want the draft, under in revised, being revised, um, we'd be happy to share. So you can email us. Um, that would be no problem. It's probably the quickest way to get a read of it. Um, and then about the trade-off between consulting communities and controlling the outbreaks. Of course, there, there's a trade-off in, in disasters. Obviously, the quicker the response, probably the better the outcome. But at the end of the day, 
all communities have rights to be consulted about ways that their lands potentially are going to be permanently impacted. And even in particularly challenging situations, like where you're working uh, with communities that are very mobile, I think um, the, the basic rights that communities have can't, can't be denied just because there is an emergency at play. Um, and one of the ways that there's, they've been trying to get around this is because they can surveil so well from above, it's been easy to say, well, there's no one there, so there's no need to consult. But that overlooks the importance of spiritual sites, of dry season grazing grounds, um, of underground water sources that are vital to community survival. So yes, food security matters, but um, human, human rights, I think in this context really matter too. And then I put another answer to a question just in the chat. Um, there was a question above about who's involved in supplying the conservation tech in Northern Kenya. And I just pointed out the actors in Northern Kenya are really interesting. They're not the traditional actors we might expect. And although there's kind of this military conservation nexus, um, it's probably less prominent than these more like innovative startup companies that are providing technology for conservancies to experiment with. Um, and I think thinking about how these relationships and where they're made where people are meeting and um, how they're getting access to each other is quite is quite interesting. Those types of assemblages, where and how they form. That's lovely. Um, Brock, did you want to add anything? Uh, no, I'm happy with Harrison's response. <laughs> lovely teamwork. Um, well, there is a couple of questions that have come in that are kind of similar, so I'm going to try and group them a little bit. We've got tons of questions, so I advise that all the speakers have a look um, at the chat in due course as well. Um, and one of the, the kind of questions is around um, a kind of theme that's undercut a lot of your presentations around the kind of valuation and the recognition of different knowledges. So we might be thinking about kind of aerial knowledges, algorithmic knowledges, indigenous um, knowledges, local community knowledges, and as, as Karis just said there, kind of... Um, you know, spiritual knowledges and, and entities as well. Um, and so I guess it would be really interesting to hear a little bit more about this kind of va this valuation and this recognition of, uh, of different types of knowledges in each of your field sites. Um, and to link on to that, um, Ben Newport uh, asks to all of you as well, in relation to poaching and anti-poaching, do any of you know of instances where poachers have used drones to locate target species? Um, and are conservation actors um, having to invest in anti-drone technologies? And we're obviously seeing a kind of massive shift to counter drone systems um, in other settings too. So I think these questions collectively are about the valuation and recognition of different knowledges, but also of different agencies. So how might people be kind of fighting back against those drones as well? Um, so I don't know if anyone wants to wave at me if they want to get started to say something in response to that. Yeah, please, Libby, go ahead. Um, I don't know of anything about um, poaching syndicates using drones. Maybe Francis does, um, but I, I haven't heard of that. But it, honestly, it wouldn't surprise me if that's the case. They're pretty technologically sophisticated and well-funded. Um, that, that would be a really fascinating, I think, line of investigation. <laughs> if anyone wants to do that, I would read that paper in a heartbeat. Um, about knowledge systems, that's such an important point. And I have to admit that, you know, when I first started to do this work on green militarization and the use of drone technology and so forth, I, I was a bit of a Luddite in the sense of like, oh, drones are evil. Um, but I think with, you know, seeing what's going on with indigenous use of drones to protect territory um, elsewhere, including in Blackfoot territory across the US Canada border, it really pulled the rug out from under me and my simplistic assumptions. In, in a really good way, in a really way that I think had to happen. Um, but I do think Western scholarship has a way of, I think, in trying to be generous and respectful to say, you know, drones are antithetical to Indigenous knowledge because it is place-based and so forth. But one of the things I've seen um, with kind of advances in the way we're, we, um, we as, you know, primarily Western scholars think about um, Indigenous knowledge is that Indigenous knowledge is a living thing and it, it responds to political challenges and environmental change. Um, and, and to think that it's antithetical doesn't really give it Indigenous knowledge systems justice because it responds and changes as well. And 
uh, one of the ways that drones are being used with the bison reintroduction is to try to locate historical migration paths because drones can get up high enough and do it cheaply enough to see if we can see in the landscape where, where bison moved and that's pretty phenomenal. Um, and so I think that integration has not been as sort of difficult or as messy as it necessarily the assumptions were. Um, so I guess that's where where I would come from is to, you know, it's about the integration of the braiding of knowledge systems. That's really important to pay attention to. But I just wanna add briefly, I hope I'm not talking too much. What Karis was talking about, um, it's not just about knowledge systems, but, but, but about territorial systems. And these assumptions about, well, there's no people there, that's such like a Westphalian, Western understanding of territory and not getting at these indigenous, um, much more sophisticated and historical, um, moving into the, you know, complex um, human environment relations and new types of futures and so forth. That I think it's also about territory systems. That was just such a fascinating point, Karis. I really appreciate you, you bringing that. I think it really enriched kind of our, uh, our understanding of the different systems of power at play here. Thank you. I really like Oh my gosh, sorry. You can tell me and Brock are sitting in the same house. We live in the same household. Um, I really like the point you just made too. And I think that's what it comes down to, isn't it? Is that the integration of different ways of seeing the world is not that impossible. And probably most of us would expect that if chemicals were going to be sprayed over our head, there would be some integration of what our lives look like and what we need if chemicals are to be sprayed and what people are doing from above. It just seems like a natural way to integrate people's people's knowledges, but it, it just isn't happening. And maybe in our case, that's because an effective quick response is needed. Maybe in poaching, it's the same justification. We need effective, we need quick. But at, at the end of the day, it just wouldn't be that challenging to um, consult people and merge knowledge systems rather than allow one to reign physically vertical <laughs> above the other, but also in a hierarchy. Thank you. That's that's brilliant. Um, we've got a couple of other questions coming in. Um, one of the questions and some of the comments are really um, kind of getting at the drone, um, not just as a camera platform, but of course, as a kind of multi -set, um, sensory form of capture. Um, Serge has uh, kind of described a case of poachers being detected by a drone with thermal infrared um, and some events that uh, kind of uh, occurred after that. And we've got a question from Nicholas Vargas um, to all the panelists, um, which uh, states that commercially available drones currently lack sound recording microphones on board, but this capability is being developed. How will this affect drone surveillance as well as research ethics? Um, so I think it would be really interesting to hear a little bit more about kind of multi-sensory drone capture, as that's also obviously a theme that's kind of um, in the, the broader methodological literature as well. So if there's anyone that wants to wave to talk about um, acoustics or other forms of sensors, please do. Sure. I can start briefly. Um, not about drones though, so I'm dodging the question a bit. Um, I mean, we can talk about drones, but I think the lack of drones in some of like the most famous poaching securitized conservation areas is, is quite fascinating. But these other sensory, uh, one of the big ones being kind of acoustic gunshot locators, um, motion detectors along fences. Um, and I think the, the main logic here is really to try to detect some sort of anomaly uh, and then being able to respond as quickly as possible. Um, and so there's kind of a, a step change in approach from kind of deploying and surveilling by foot with patrols that is still done to um, in a lot of places where this tech can be used of actually just having kind of, you know, home bases of rangers that are then deployed when something gets, gets triggered, which is kind of a, a quite different model of doing things. Um, if no one else wants to add on that, um, a further question um, that we've got, and we're sort of running towards the end of our time now, so um, I'll invite uh, folks to, to offer their reflections um, on the last couple of questions. Um, the first question is around the kind of agencies of the technology and the way that we think about um, the technology, um, its agencies, its intelligence, it's, which is something that Francis and, and Law have touched on in different ways. 
Um, so I'm thinking about with in the case of drones, there are, you know, intelligent flight modes on particular types of platforms that enable tracking and following capabilities. Um, clearly, there are increasingly autonomous um, capabilities. Um, but there are also kind of interruptive moments as well where drones fail and other uh, types of technology also fail. So I wondered if um, either Law or Francis or you both would like to say anything about kind of technological agency and moments of failure as well and what that means to think about tech as kind of agents in this, this discussion. Law, would you like to start or? So I think, I think with the, with the, so, the two parts of the question right the autonomy and and when they when and their agency is one thing and i think the issue with that with that is the accountability of people who then make decision on the basis of what what the technology has done or what um, information or recommendation it's come up with and that's something that uh, we're still grappling with in so many different areas of, of society right medicine justice automated transport and I, it will probably be the same for for conservation um and then the, the moment of failure i think for me when i've encountered drones in my qualitative field work have been what i've encountered the most actually um it, it's probably because drones were um invested in probably not the right kind of drones for the right kind of purpose invested in by state um, agencies in, in Indonesia in, in the cases that I was in Sumatra in the cases that I was looking at and they just didn't didn't serve the the, the purpose that they were they were um the, the hope was they would fulfill uh, for example the the idea was that they would they would protect rangers by flying ahead uh, on patrols or um they would they would actually fly, which in a lot of cases they they did for a couple ten minutes and then they didn't anymore. Um, and so yeah, the the and in the end were used mostly for communication purposes rather than any biodiversity monitoring or, or law enforcement because of because of the these uh, the failing moments. Thank you so much. And Francis, I'm sorry, we just don't have time to get to your um, point, but I'm sure it would have been a really good one. So please do add it to the chat if you have the, the energy. Um, I'm just going to pass back over to Naomi so we can keep it as tight as possible on time, seeing as the timing has been flawless so far. I don't want to be the one to let it down. So thank you so much, everyone, and to our tech help as well. And Naomi, um, yeah, feel free to take the floor.